Amen. Here today to appreciate our pastors. So if I could, I'll ask my fellow deacons to come up. Unfortunately, Pastor Matt uh, took on a fever yesterday, so he's not with us today. But uh, we'll give him his cards uh, as soon as he's better. Pastor Kevin, Pastor Mike, if you come up. Pastor Mike. Yes. We are so grateful you're with us. I don't know if anybody knows this, but when we had COVID, we started a prayer group on Thursday mornings. And we were praying for a worship leader. And you answered the prayer. So I just wanted for the congregation just to thank you for your, your dedication to worship and, and your beautiful voice that you have. And also for your dedication to discipleship. We really appreciate you. And, and we have the cards here. Yep, Mike's. And also from the church, I'm going to present you with something here. Okay. Pastor Mike. And I'd be remiss if I didn't remember his wife. Jeanette does a wonderful job here also. Pastor Kevin, I've been here eight and a half years and I've seen so much uh, growth and everything from you, Lord, and, and, and you gave me the growth. You gave me uh, mentorship, discipleship. And I think one thing that we're really grateful for from both of our pastors, all three of our pastors, is they speak the word of God. They don't mince words, they read the scripture. And I can tell you that this pastor is a prayer warrior. He prays every day for all of us. And on Thursdays we pray, he prays with different groups, he has Bible studies. And he's also a man of vision. His vision brought about Legacy Christian Academy. And he revived UHA. And he's also, he revived the association and he's an interim uh, ASM now with the association. So I'm just, i just so grateful to have you as my pastor. And I think everybody else is as well. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, Red Dam family. Uh, thank you, and thank you for being here this morning. And we're going to uh, continue in our worship service by opening the scriptures. And before we do that, we're going to open up in a word of prayer. So I'm going to ask you to do something a little different. I'm just going to ask you as you sit there, just kind of open your hands like this right here, if you would be willing, as we pray. And as you do that, it's really going to be symbolic, I hope, of your heart, of just saying, Lord, I want my hearts to be open to your word. I don't want to hear from you today as all for myself back to you. And so as we do this, let's pray together. Father, we come into your presence as your people called by your name set apart by your spirit and even by your word. And Lord, we want to hear from you today and we want to worship you in spirit and truth. And so Lord, speak to our hearts and as our hands are open, it's symbolic to our hearts being open to hear from you. Help us to submit our lives to the leading of your spirit and the clear teaching of your scripture. For we seek to honor and glorify you and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll go ahead and pull them out, uh, we are in the book of Jude, uh, Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter, uh, only 25 verses. This is our fourth week in this short epistle, um, but it's just so action-packed. And this morning we're talking about developing a spirit of discernment. Lord, help us to have a discerning spirit. In essence, Lord, help us not to be so gullible. Help us to have a discerning spirit. Uh, because we need a discerning spirit as we live in the last days. 
If you've been with us for any amount of time, uh, you know that we, in our study in the book of Jude, uh, we have been warned of the fact that there are many false teachers, and certainly that was true in Jude's day, and if it was true in Jude's day, how much more is that true in our life, in our day and age? That there's false teachers, there's false um, people that are, are peddling and pushing a false gospel. And so it's our job, as we live in this day and age in which we live, to make sure that we grow in discernment. There are those that have the spiritual gift of discernment. It's a su supernatural gift that where God gives you the ability to be able to spot phony um, and, and false motives and errors uh, in people and things that may be taking place. I find it interesting that most people think they have that spiritual gift and they don't, um, but there are those that have the gift of discernment. What I've come to learn, typically speaking, those who taught the most typically don't have the gift of discernment. That's not universally true, it's just been through my own experience. Uh, those that are slow to speak and they are quick to read the room and read people are typically those that God has wired to be able to discern. When you have a strong personality like I do, uh, early on in, in, in my life and certainly in ministry, I had the, um, it was just foolishness on my part. I would just run over the, the people that had discernment around me because I was too busy of wanting to conquer the mountain and I didn't want to hear anybody give me any, any reason of why we couldn't do that or to warn me. But after graduating from the school of hard knocks, a lot of hardship, a lot of heartache, a lot of spiritual scars that I have worn, um, that I have, uh, I've learned to value not only this spiritual gift, uh, but those that, that, that have it. But equally, I've also sought to, to grow personally in discernment. And it's kind of like evangelism. Those may have the gift of evangelism, but we're all called to grow in evangelism and to evangelize. We're all commanded to do that. So you may not have the gift of discernment, but the reality is you're called to grow in discernment. And man, if there was ever a time in the course of history that we needed some people that could navigate through the craziness of life and uh, the false narratives that are being pushed, it is certainly now. So if Jude felt this in the first century, um, church, how much more as we're living in the last of the last days do we need uh, just some discerning spirits and voices speaking not only to the body of Christ but even to our culture. And if you think it's been crazy over the last few years, you hadn't seen anything yet, ten days from now there's going to be a whole nother level of crazy and I don't care how this election turns out because there's just so much intensity, energy, and craziness that we're in. In a lot of ways, as I've told you over the last several weeks, just um, is, our society as a whole is under the disciplined hand of God. And it's going to be interesting over the next few weeks. But I heard a guy say this uh, um, last week, and I thought it was right. he was right on. He said, no matter how this election turns out, he says the level of mental health crisis that we're going to see and face as a culture is going to be something like we've never seen before. Now, I don't say that to turn this message into a political message by no means, but what I am saying is that we need discernment, right? We need to be able to navigate between all the noises that are coming our way. We need it uh, not only in the body of Christ, but even culturally speaking. Why is that? Because we're living in a post-Christian culture, meaning that those that are in the culture are going to use the Christian narrative and Christian terminology to push whatever it is that's being pushed. And we have to be willing to say, what does the scripture teach? What does the Bible say? And how do I bring myself under the authority of scripture and not get caught up in all of the emotional chaos that very easily, and, and we pretty much can see that's before us. And so, Lord, help us have a spirit of discernment. And that really is, is my prayer for you this morning as well as myself, um, is Lord, help us have a discerning spirit. This last few weeks for me has been pretty busy, and I've had a, the privilege of, of officiating like four different weddings over the last few weeks. And I was at one yesterday, and as I was at the wedding, we were at the reception, I was talking to a family member and I asked the family member if they were still going to a particular church. And he said, yeah, he's been going there for a while. He said, the church is really growing. They've got two services. They both are filled up. There's just a lot of excitement, a lot of energy that's taking place. And I said, that's great. He said, but I'm not really plugged in. I said, well, why are you not plugged in? He said, well, 
he said, I struggle a little bit with where, where the church is. I said, well, what do you struggle with? He said, well, the pastor's a great guy. He said, I like him, very nice, very, I mean, you cannot not like this pastor. He says, but, but he won't ever touch or deal with sin at all. And I said, well, I said, that's a problem, right? If, if he's going to teach and preach the whole counsel of God, there's going to be times that he's going to have to touch and deal with some, some, some tough social issues and even you're, he's going to have to deal with sin and, and what's around him because the Bible addresses those things. He's like, yeah, but he won't because he don't want to offend anybody. I said, well, that, that's not good at all. But what was happening is he was developed and growing in his discernment of saying something's not right. Something's off. And he just hadn't gotten to the place where he was processing that to the point of where he says, hey, I need to move to action. And that didn't mean blow up the church. It may very well mean leave that church. But nonetheless, there was a discerning spirit that he was, he was growing in. And so as we, we dive into Jude, we're recognizing that there is a lot of false and phony. And we know that that's true in the church. But we also know in a post-Christian culture that there's a lot of things that are, are peddled under the umbrella of Christianity that's not necessarily Christianity. And, and so as we navigate through that, I'm going to jump in and out in our conversation or in, in the sermon, speaking culturally and then speaking within the church. In all of that, all of the umbrella, under the umbrella of realizing that uh, just because somebody's charismatic, just because they're telling you what you want to hear, don't be so gullible. Always measure things up against the scriptures. And so let me go ahead and give you application, the application for this morning. Number one, as I said, we've got to grow in a spirit of discernment so we can't be so gullible. Number two, if we're going to do that, we've got to saturate our hearts and minds with the scriptures. And just saturating them is one thing, but the second thing is we've got to be willing to be faithful and to bring ourselves under the authority of scripture. So it's not what, what this person says or that person says, what does the Bible say? And the Bible has to be that, that rule, that guide in which guides and navigates our lives. And if you're part of a church and you're visiting here and, and the scriptures are not expounded on and they're not preached and they're not taught, you just need to find a new church. And if me or anybody else occupies this pulpit, this place, that doesn't preach or teach the scriptures, then you find, need to find a new pastor. And that puts my name there as well. You need to find a new pastor if I ever cease to do that. Why? Because that is what we're bringing ourselves under the authority of. Of what does the Bible say? And how does it apply to my life? Because the Word of God is living, it's alive, it's active, and, and it speaks to our hearts. It's what the Holy Spirit uses to bring transformation in our lives. And so the argument that Jude is making in this epistle, and he's just saying the same thing over and over again, is that there's people that have crept into your, in the church and in your life that are trying to get you to compromise on the clear teachings of the Scriptures that's been handed down to you, and you better contend and fight like crazy to stay true to the Scriptures and to hand those down to the next generation. And we're living in some crazy times because you've got quote-unquote Christians that are saying that there's more than one gender. But yet when you read the Bible, God says that he made them both male and female, right, in the image of God. And, and all of this is Satan coming in in a very subtle way, doing anything and everything he can to destroy God's word, God's people, and to, to make us compromise or to get us to compromise and there's really two extremes, and we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks, that we've got to really guard our hearts and lives against. And that is, one, we're not going to be given to the extreme of liberalism, because the Word of God is very clear that we're not called to be liberal. But then in the same sense, we can't be given to legalism either, because it can't be, uh, you know, this pious, you know, look who I am, better than you, works-based type salvation. It, it can't be that either. It's, it's really living within those, the, the tension of saying, you know what, I, the Word of God has to be my guide, um, guide in life. And so, before we dive into verse 12, I just want to revisit the Sermon on the Mount that we looked at a few weeks ago as we were walking, as we were walking through Jude. And I just think this portion of it speaks so much to what we're talking about. And it's uh, Matthew 5, verse 13. Jesus is speaking, and this is, um, this is Jesus in Matthew 5, and he's just being so um, clear. It was in the message from last week, I mean from this morning. You don't have it? And uh, so 
in Matthew 5, Jesus talks about being salt and being light. He says, you are the salt of the earth. He says, but if salt loses its flavor, he says, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be what? Thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And so when he's saying you're called to be the salt of the, the, the earth, the salt of the world, what he's saying is that you're not going to compromise truth. You're, you're going to stand on truth. And as you're going to stand on truth, what does that do? It preserves, and, and we've said this before, you remove the church off the scene in the day and age in which we live, where does culture go? Where does this world go? What's holding back evil? Ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit, but it's the Holy Spirit working through God's people, the church, who stand up and speak out and stand for truth. But not only are we to be salt, but notice what verse 14 says. It says, you are also what? The light of the world. That means that we are to, to not only be set apart and our lives should be marked with a spirit of, of holy. Of, of being holy but equally that we are to have compassion and love for people it says a city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden that people see us and something about who we are uh, makes them desire to want to know God more verse 15 and 16 it says nor do they take a lamp and, and put it under a basket but on a lampstand and give it light to all who are in the house and then verse 16 let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven and so the point is that we're called to to stand for truth and to worship God in spirit and truth, spirit and truth, right? We're going to walk with God and live in the and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, but in the same sense, in that we're going to stand on the Word of God, and there's no compromising. And so, as we we navigate through this interesting time in which we live, what that means is that there's going to be people that's not going to like you because of what you believe and what you hold to, but. You can't, or neither can I, allow those that may disagree with us, who may seem like they're our enemies, become our enemies. Right? They may you look at you as an enemy, but you can't look at them as an enemy. Because we can never view the mission field as our enemies. Jesus came on a search and rescue mission, what? To seek and save that which was lost. And that is where going to an extreme will take you, to where it looks like us against them. Right? I, I'm right, they're wrong, and you may very be right, or well right if you're standing on the, the truth of Scripture, but here's the deal. They need the gospel just as much as we need the gospel. They needed the gospel. And so we have to have a heart for people. And Jesus deals with that in the Sermon on the Mount. We have to have a heart for those that are far from God and those that the enemy has blinded. So we are, are, are called to, to speak the truth and that's what I've said, if somebody's going to be mad at you, let them be mad at you because of content, not because of the way you deliver it, not because of the way you carry yourself, not because of spiritual arrogance, not because that you slander or you tear people apart or because there's just, just mean spirit about you. Right? God's never commanded us to be really mean and nasty. But he has called us to stand for truth. And so living and navigating between those two things of saying, I'm going to live, I'm going to, this, this truth out, I'm not going to compromise, not everybody's going to like me, and that's certainly okay, and I'm going to be the light of the world, not perfect, but redeemed by Christ, and I want people to see, see Jesus in me, and I'm going to have a heart for those that may cause me some of the greatest pain, and may be even pushing some of the things that I stand the strongest against. I'm going to have a heart for them and pray for them because I want to see them come to know Jesus the Jesus in whom I know. That's living within those tensions. And so I say that to bring us to Jude because the reality is that there are going to be those that are going to come into the church and they're going to peddle and push false narratives, false gospel, a false gospel. They're going to, to push anything and everything to, to draw crowds and to build a following. And one of the ways that you can know whether or not you are listening to a false teacher or not is if they're more interesting, more interested in building a platform than they are the body of Christ. If, if, if a person's more interested in building a platform than they are the body of Christ, then you better watch out. I, I, you know, I, I'm not a big social media guy. I think most of you know that. You don't see me on Facebook and, and those types of things um, a whole lot. Now, our messages ultimately are pushed there and they're ultimately pushed on YouTube, but I do very little personal type stuff on social media. For the simple fact is that I don't want to get caught up in trying to build a platform instead of building the body of Christ. 
And that is so easy to, ha- it can so easily happen. And there's so many under the umbrella of Christendom that are, that are, that are cultural warriors, and they're doing it under the umbrella of, of, of Christian name, but it's more about building a platform than it is in a following than it is really about the body of Christ. And you can see it. When you sit back and you look, you can see it. And we just have to really guard ourselves against that. And if we're going to grow in discernment, we've got to know, and, and we've got to ask the Lord to help us. Say, Lord, wh- who, who's, who's pushing and, and investing in people? And who's really pushing their name and trying to build a following? You know, I listened to one guy this week, and I thought it was pretty profound. It was a seminary, seminary professor speaking to church planners. And this is what he said. He says, listen, he says, when you love the ministry more than you love the people, you've gone off the rails. And I cannot tell you how easy it is for pastors to fall into that trap. And how much we've seen that over the last 20 to 30 years. The where guys are more interested in building their brand than they are the body of Christ. You know, I used to be attracted to the well-spoken, charismatic pastors that could package messages in certain ways and, and, and just could, could just, it, was, it just resonated the way they, they delivered and they packaged it and they were just charismatic and all that. But I found myself as I get older, I'm not gravitated to those guys as much as I used to be. But instead, I'm more gravitated towards the person who doesn't care about a social media account who's given to prayer and that loves and serves the body of Christ faithfully and is willing to live in obscurity because those are the guys that knows what it means to walk with Jesus. I'm not saying that everybody that's on the national scene is not of God. Please don't take it that way. But you understand the point in what I'm making. And so Jude says that there's false teachers and there's false members within the body. And you got to recognize that. And you can't say, well, I'm not going to church or I'm not being a part because there's phonies and there's hypocrites. Listen, we're all hypocrites. We, we all need Jesus. But there also are false converts and pastors and teachers within the local churches. And there are also those that are on the national scenes just as well. And it's been like that since the beginning. Listen, if Judas Iscariot can walk with Jesus for three and a half years, and I promise you, he would have been the last most least likely person that any of the disciples would have thought would have been a false convert. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, they entrusted the money with him. And who do you give money to that you, can't, that you can entrust that you don't trust? But if that can happen to Jesus, and the New Testament makes it clear over and over again that that's going to happen in the la- latter days, then we need to be aware of that. And we need to not be so gullible. And we need to rightly divide the word of truth and we need to saturate our hearts and minds with scripture and we need to be willing to only place ourselves continue under those that are going to teach the the whole counsel of God. He said these are spots, some of um, or are blemishes at your love feast. So there's a church gathering to share a meal and he says there's those that, that, that just they stain your gatherings. Some of your translations even say they're, they're like hidden reefs and so they, they, they are under the radar that you don't even see them. You think of the Titanic and it's cruising along and then all of a sudden it hits that iceberg and it just, it, you know the, the rest of that story. So that's the type of devastation. Those that, that, that are more about self than the body, more about pushing their own narrative than really the body of Christ. That, that have let their lives become their idols instead of really having a heart for Jesus and people. He says they will bring much destruction. And notice it says that they don't have any fear. And what we're going to see this morning too, that if there's ever going to be a a, a revival or any type of awakening in our lifetime, then what's going to happen is that the church, the church has to rediscover what it means to fear the Lord. And I think one of the great signs of knowing whether somebody is real or not, or at least walking with God or not, or in fellowship with God or not, is can you gauge the fear of the Lord that's on their lives? Meaning that they just don't have the, the right, and they realize this, or the ability to just go and to, to behave any which way that they want to behave, because they, they recognize, one that has the fear of the Lord recognizes that their life is accountable to God. 
And so he says these are, uh, these are spots for your love feet. He said they're serving only themselves. It's all about their narrative. And, and, I, and I'm telling you, Jude is not meant for words. I mean, he just knows that he can describe these guys with all this, these metaphors of, of just what they're like. He says they're clouds without water. Uh, they, they promise a whole lot, but they deliver very little. Right? They're, they're carried about with the wind. Uh, they're late autumn trees without fruit. He's, they're, they're supposed to bring fruit, but you know what? They, there's no fruit. There's no fruit of the Spirit that's showing in their lives. He says they're twice dead. Not just one dead, but twice dead. Pulled up from his roots. He says they're spiritually separated from, from, from God because they're dead. And so he says these are the characteristics of them. Notice verse 13. He says, raging waves of the sea. You think of all the, the energy and, and the, the power of a sea. Says, and, and it's just, the, the raging waves of, of the sea is foaming up their own shame. He says, there's all this noise and all this energy, but yet it's just all over the place. Wandering stars whom is reserved the blackness of the darkness forever. They're, they're unstable. There's instability. There, there's no fruit. They promise but they, the world, but they deliver, deliver very little. And they're just full of themselves. He said, this is what those that are, that, that are peddling a false gospel. He said, these are their characteristics. And he gave us some historical examples. Um, if you were with us last week, and you could read the previous verses for yourself and see those things. But he says, this is what, what, what they're, the, the characteristics of what they're made, made up. And notice verse 14. Uh, and, and he loves to pull, Jude does, uh, some, some extra biblical or controversial things. He doesn't mind dropping um, some some hot topics in in his in his epistle and for here he says even enoch or now enoch the seventh from adam now if you you know your bibles you know enoch was the seventh from adam you can read about him in the book of genesis but the book of enoch uh was equivalent i guess to a, a commentary on on the old testament was not biblically inspired it's not, doesn't carry the same weight as what the scriptures that you that carry that you're holding in your lap but nonetheless uh, Jude recognizes that what Enoch was talking about was biblically accurate, at least in this part, because he says, now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. What? Those that are peddling the false gospel, those that are being used by Satan to bring destruction on the church. He says, behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints, meaning that Jesus is coming back on that day. What is that day? The day of the Lord. If you were with us as we walk through 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, you know that there's going to be a day of reckoning. It's more than a 24-hour day you could sum that up with the tribulation period but that day ultimately is a climactic point when Jesus physically comes back to this earth and his feet touch the Mount of Olives and, and they split and he comes and he destroys the wicked and he holds accountable all those that have rebelled against him and he says that he's coming back now what's very interesting in the day and time in which we live is that there has been this, reassur this resurgence of this doomsday type, apocalyptic type um, mindset that's taking place. And this is outside the body of Christ. This is terminology like the, the grid's going to go down and nine out of ten Americans are going to die or uh, there's going to be nuclear war that's going to take place with, with Russia and, and all of this stuff and, and everybody's like just with this, this tension and it's just tense and it's like is there going to be like this day of reckoning are we just America just going to be annihilated this doomsday mentality but here's the thing those that are saying that if you would kind of so well, let me ask you a question do you think that Jesus of Nazareth is coming back and with him's coming back judgment and there's going to be casualty that day and there's going to be this day of break. Do you believe that? And you know what the vast majority of them will tell you? No, that's absolutely ludicrous. That's, that's silly. And you know what we do as Bible-believing Christians? We're like, well, that's not what the Bible says. Because the Bible says that he is coming back. And he came as the gentle... Savior, suffering servant the first time, but when he comes back the second time, we know he's coming back with vengeance and he's going to judge the rebellious nations. And we know that. And he's going to hold people accountable. And what I think is happening is we're in these last of days. I think all of the noise and all this stuff that's just stirring so many people up, obviously it's, 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 it's preparing people that there's going to be a judgment. And certainly if you read the book of Revelation and you deal with the tribulation period, 
There is much casualty and chaos. It's the wrath of God that's being poured out on the nations. So you say, well, I, I just don't think that there's going to be any judgment. Then why is there so much doomsday stuff that's being pushed? And why does your Bible say that Jesus is coming back and he's going to hold the nations accountable? Why is it? It's because we know that we're, we're getting closer and closer to those returns. And so we look in a time where we see so much evil being revealed. I mean, you look at what is being revealed from the sexual sin and just the, the, the nastiness and craziness and the satanic rituals and, and things that, that have taken place in high places with, with government officials, Hollywood, music industry, all of those things. You know this, you listen to it, you've seen it. You look at all of this stuff that's being revealed. What is happening? God is already judging our nation and he's turning the light on. He's letting us see the amount of evil that has going on under our noses look at the amount of pastors just within the last few years that have fallen morally I mean majorly look look at the stuff that's being brought to light and so you may sit back and say well you know is, is God gonna ever judge friends he's already judging but he ain't done because it's gonna be a whole lot worse and so as we live in this world and we say how do we navigate through this we can't become bitter angry people once again to where the mission field becomes our enemies no we're to be on a search and rescue mission and to love jesus and to love people and we're to stand for truth and we're going to live between all these tensions and we're going to be faithful for jesus and we're going to say god we want to be a light in the midst of darkness and we want to be able to speak truth and we want to be able to speak it in love and we just want to be the people that you called us to be and honestly we're the only ones in all the world that have the answers and I get that there's so much that gets pushed and there, there's so many narratives and you've heard me say this before. There will never be an event in our lifetime again that we will watch and we will see that there will not be another narrative that will come out and say what you saw and what, and, and what you heard is not the real thing. This is really what happened. And I get that your heads can spin. And you're like, well, well, did it really happen? Is this really what's going on? What, what's going on? I don't know. But I know this, he knows, and I know the scriptures are true, and I know that I can't get caught up in all the craziness. I've got to stay on mission and say, God, I want to be set apart for you and for the gospel, and I want to make sure that God's, your people are strengthened and encouraged, and they're going to be faithful to live out the gospel light in, their last, in, in the last days in which we live, in the time in which you called us to live. That's what we're called to do. And we can't be given to the extremes. Because there's only one answer, there's only one hope, and we know who that is. It's Christ. And he's not turning a blind eye to anything. He is very much in control, even when it seems as if it's as dark as it possibly could get. Verse 15. He says, to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in ungodly ways and all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him he says that he sees all he knows all he hears all and there's going to be a day of reckoning verse 16 he says what is the characteristics of these people he says they're grumblers they're complainers walking according to their own lusts he said they mouth great swelling words they flatter people to gain advantage they, they, they mock and gawk at the word of God. So I, I don't believe that. I, I don't want that. And you know, if, if you're that person that likes to pick and choose what part, part of the scriptures you, you, you want to submit yourselves to, and I get you, you got to have healthy hermeneutics to, to understand um, when, when you study the scriptures that there was an original author, original audience, and you've got to understand the context in which it was written and be willing to do the work to, to make the journey from the first century whenever it was written to the 21st century. And so it takes work. And you can take the Bible and make it say anything that you want it to say. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about saturating our hearts with Scripture and having healthy hermeneutics, rule of interpretation, of asking the Holy Spirit to guide us that when we, just as we pray, God, speak to our hearts so we may know how to respond. Give us wisdom. That if we will approach God daily with a spirit of humility, recognizing that our lives are accountable to Him, and saying, Lord, we want to walk and live in the fear of the Lord, then the Holy Spirit will guide us and direct us in all truth. And that we can navigate in these very dark days. And our lives can be counted for his good and for glory. Even though you may be misunderstood. 
even though there may be some people that you've listened to for a long time, all of a sudden you start seeing and hearing some things that you know don't line up with Scripture, and you're like, ah, I think I may have to back away from that. So what do we do? How do we respond? False teachers are here. They're not going anywhere. Evil is running rampant, but yet God's still in control. Is in and outside the church. God's saying, hey, you got to have discernment. And as you had have discernment, you got to be willing to saturate your heart and mind with the Scriptures, place yourself under the authority of Scripture, and just be faithful in a faithless culture. And in that, and this is huge, do not forsake the gathering and the assembling together as brothers and sisters. You say, well, I didn't say that, Jude. No, but it does say it in Hebrews. Because here's the deal. There's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. You cannot navigate and live in these dark times alone. And you can try. And I will guarantee you, you'll end up falling on your face. We need the body of Christ. I need you and you need me. And you want to know if somebody's walking with Jesus, that they love Jesus and they love the people. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of Scripture. We thank you for the warning that Jude has given over and over again. And Lord, as we transition to an invitation time, it's an opportunity for people to respond. Lord, for those that may be in here this morning that know good and well that they've never placed their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. God, I pray more than anything that right now that they would recognize their sin and their shortcoming but equally recognize that you love them so much that you sent your son Jesus to die in their stead. But if they would come to the place of seeing their sin and recognizing Jesus and the work that he's done on Calvary for them, that if they'll come to the place and asking Christ to save them and forgive them, Lord, that you would, and their lives would be transformed, that in the quietness of their hearts, they would say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for where I've sinned and fallen short of your glory. But at this moment, this place, I ask you to come and to save me as I place my faith in you. Father, we give this all to you for your name's sake, for your glory. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.